liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, February 20th, 2023. Time for another show. I feel like possibly someone has fiddled around with my chair here. I feel like it's lower than usual. I don't know. And uh, it's not immediately obvious how I can readjust that. Usually there's a little lever right here, but as I recall, this this chair built a little differently. And so I, every time I, I touch levers that I think are going to raise the chair up, it... Uh, locks things in place or uh springs the seat forward so uh mm, i'll have to figure out this luxurious chair maybe about time to be uh replaced for it anyway as with most of our equipment that's the way it goes all right and speaking of replaced equipment greg dworkin is i, I believe ready to go today but it's still not got his regular equipment back but i guess he's got something new in terms of backup equipment and maybe he'll explain it to you. maybe he won't it might not be interesting it might not be important but as you know we have two hours so we'll see but at any rate yes uh everything appears to be ready to go so we'll give that a shot later on we have much to catch up on even though we Oh, let's see. We crammed in a lot of long-form materials over the weekend, and I got a lot of interest afterwards, people asking about that. What was the link to that Roger Stone story? After all, my mom wanted to see it. My brother wanted to see it. Those are the two people who wanted to see it. <laughs> That's a lot of public interest. More than usual. Very rarely do people actually, you know, actually uh, write afterwards and say, I want to have that thing. But that's very often because we make it pretty clear where the thing is coming from and of course scott anderson rounds up all of those stories and links to all of those stories every afternoon and we post it over at daily coast and so very often uh you're able to find those things with relative ease let's say all right now i'll ask for a clarification from justice uh, justice if he's still around and at the controls everything seems to be fine nothing wrong with that but you know he daily tips me off to the stories that have caught his attention in the morning and uh, one of them was that, uh, what does he say? That was some wedding at Mar-a-Lago. Was there a wedding? at? Mar I missed that entirely. You know, I was busy. There was a lot going on for us this weekend. And uh, you know how it is. You disconnect a little bit. But uh, other things I think I'm pretty well up to speed on. But maybe Greg has that among his 25 messages in his Rafto stories today. I imagine that one is probably not on the table. But uh, I'll check it out and see if we can figure out what is going on. And, uh, well, I mean, in, in uh, weddings at Mar-a-Lago, anyway. Must have had something go on, and probably Trump showed up and probably gave a uh, rager of a speech, and maybe that's what's going on. Oh, Tiffany Trump. Oh, okay. Is that it? No, no, no. That's an old piece here. What happens at two days ago? Uh, uh, I don't know. Well, we'll see if we can't figure that out uh, before everything is all over. And, uh, oh, Justice has sent it along here. So, okay, now I'm going to tell you. Now you're in for it. Uh, let's see, a tweet from, uh, holy moly, look at that. Uh, a tweet from Patriot Takes. Yesterday's wedding at Mar-a-Lago that Trump posted about, and I'm sure that's why I missed it. If, if that was the source of the news, Trump posting about it. But, uh, hmm. What's happening here? There's a, a large archway of flowers that, and then there appears to be fireworks as well. And I'm wondering whether does the, do the fireworks catch anything on fire? I'm not entirely sure, but it's a, a dramatic exit. It looks like from the, is it, or is it, it's an entrance? I guess this must be the father of the bride bringing somebody through. Um, but then, hmm, on the other hand, Justice did type to me, not the father of the bride. So I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but we'll have to see if we can figure some of it out. Let's see what other notes he might have sent along here. Well, at any rate, uh, a thing happened. We might be able to figure out what it is. We might be able to enjoy making fun of it at this point. What uh, bigger news, of course, however, it is President's Day, and that means mattress sales for one thing, and... As it happens, <clears throat> pardon me, 
It means that uh, presidents get together. I guess that's a thing now for President's Day, um, by which I mean this has happened one time. Uh, perhaps it's happened before, but President Biden, that's our president, has made an unannounced trip, as you will do when you're going to a war zone, to Ukraine. Not the Ukraine, but Ukraine itself. And he's in Kiev and elsewhere and uh, at undisclosed locations, except for the ones with famous backdrops in the photos that are being tweeted around visiting with President Zelensky, because I guess it's President's Day and it's a historic type moment. And uh, Republicans are trying right now to find out uh, how they can spin this as a total disaster and an abdication of all responsibility here in the United States. And I figure they'll come up with something by the end of the show. Greg Dworkin is here. Let's get to it because he's been gone for quite a while. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. So how's the sound? Sounds good so far. All right. Well, that's good. You know, the whole difference is that uh, since I'm on this little mini computer that is really not my regular one, it takes Mm. me instead of five minutes to set up, it takes me about 45 minutes to set up. Oh, But that's okay. Because of the smallness of this computer. Yeah. Uh, Mm. Bigness of the world. So uh, smallness of the world, I guess. What happened is Joe Biden went over to uh, Ukraine to get some ice cream. And while Mm -hmm. he was there, he uh, visited President Zelensky. And uh, he also Mm -hmm. uh, stopped at a gas station to get a hot dog. (laughs) And he took a picture Uh with uh, St. Javelin in the background. Ah. For those of you unfamiliar, St. Javelin is the patron saint of the Ukrainian war. Uh, and there's a lovely picture of her in medieval garb, uh, in green, uh, holding on to a javelin so she can shoot at Russian tanks. It's, it's really very well done. He's out of Kiev already, by the way, he's already left. Yeah. You're not allowed to know if he's in Kiev. Uh, while he was there, uh, you know, uh, he called uh, Vladimir Putin and say, Hey Vlad, guess where I am? <laughs> you should make it. How, how would you prank. like to come over for ice cream and hot dogs? What's up? What's up? Yeah. So, you know, it was a a pretty Hmm. historic thing. It was a pretty ballsy thing to do. And of course, it's going to get a lot of media, if you will recall, even if it's not with favor. Uh, uh, George W. Bush showing up in Iraq unannounced to serve Turkey on Thanksgiving. It's a big deal for the media to do stuff like that. Yeah, they're excited. They get in on it. They're in the pool. They get the secret part. They feel like uh, they're seeing history Mm. and uh, they'll play it up and they'll write it up as such. Yep. And uh, I guess that's exciting. So sure, you get a free trip out of it. You've gone to a war zone. You feel tough. Yeah. And you knew something that nobody else knew and you weren't allowed to tell anybody. Yeah. And, you know, meantime, Scott Perry from uh, Republic Land, uh, you know, says, oh, why did Biden go to Kiev when he could have been at the southern border? Mm-hmm. And uh, basically that falls over like a uh, shot down balloon. And, you know, at the same time, Matt Gates and others put in a, a, you know, defund Ukraine, Ukrainian fatigue, I think they called their bill. Hmm. Um, it, again, uh, falls over uh, uh, terribly. Uh, this is the difference between the podium that the White House has, the actual real White House and the wannabes. You know, it's, it's like the State of the Union and yeah. then whatever Sarah Huckabee Sanders did afterwards that nobody remembers, but everybody remembers what happened at the State of the Union because yeah. Dark Brandon showed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's a it'll be a difficult thing to try to deflate. I mean, it's a it's you know it's one of the prerogatives of the presidency is these sorts of foreign policy triumphs just by going. You know, and it's funny that you should say that because uh, that actually got written up uh, wow. over the weekend. In a, a quite interesting way by Ezra Klein. Part of the reason it's quite He's interesting leaking. is in the New York Times. And Maggie Haberman tweeted out the article uh, and, uh, you know, said something uh, really s- snarky and snide about the article. Uh, you know, presumably this is the way one might look at it or something like that. The theme of the article is that uh, we're not asking the right question about Biden says Ezra Klein. And this was written before the uh, uh, visit to get ice cream in Kiev. Oh, question is, when will he go to Kiev? And then the answer was today. So. so he says, there's no end of commentary gently and not so gently urging Biden to act his age and step aside. I don't think we want a president ending a second term closer to 90 than 80. But all else is never equal. And the commentaries that focus solely on Biden's central weakness, which is his age, are missing his mounting strengths. Hmm. One reason for my hesitance to de- 
declare Biden too old to run in 2024 is I thought his age was a problem in 2022, and it wasn't. Okay. Uh, he fumbled words, he fumbled phrases, and I'd argue the problem was worse then. Hmm. You know, he wielded his connection to Barack Obama as spear and shield. It was the case for his candidacy, his all-purpose defense against attacks, but Biden wasn't Obama. The Senate of the 70s is gone. You know, you can't claim that I know these guys and they're all, like, really good underneath. Biden's problem in 2020, in other words, wasn't his age. It was that he seemed stuck in the past. But Biden proved and keeps proving doubters like me wrong. He won the Democratic primary, even though voters had no shortage of fresher faces. He won the general handily, despite Trump's vaunted talents as an insult comic and social media force. Voters seem perfectly happy with Biden as a communicator. And campaigns are a lengthy sprint, but governing's a marathon. Hmm. And so I found myself worried about his vigor again. Maybe a younger, more energetic Biden would have proved better at managing relationships. But then he did the Inflation Reduction Act, Chips and Science Act. A remarkable legislative record, given the narrowness of Democrats' congressional majorities. Yes. Thank you, Nancy Pelosi. His party high expectations in the midterm <laughs> elections. Like <laughs> <laughs> COVID. It's, I blame it on COVID. I had my okay. regular course, but then I lost it. Gaining <laughs> a bit more power in the Senate and holding losses down in the House, the State of the Union was widely regarded as a success. At some point, those of us who keep declaring Biden too old to do this job need to reckon with what they've missed until now and might still be missing. So let me give it a try. Members right. of my profession have built our lives around our mastery of words, so we overestimate oh, the importance Lord. of eloquence. We like politicians who speak as if Aaron Sorkin is cranking out the dialogue, but voters don't see it that way. Hmm. Reagan proved that, W proved that, and Trump tried to teach us the same lesson, and now Biden's taken his turn. And on okay. the other hand, Biden's age has carried some quiet benefits. One is he's deftly bridged Democrats' generational and demographic gaps. Even though the parties become younger, more liberal, more educated, more online, Biden's politics were formed in a past era when blue-collar workers were still core constituency. And when Biden was younger and more uh, combative, he might have sought to vanquish the left wing of his own party, but instead he's welcomed them in. Hmm. A lot of his staff comes okay. from the younger, more liberal wing. His core group of senior advisors is made up of longtime loyalists forged in the same era he was. And the result's been a policy agenda that reflects today's party married to a political style that's more of a throwback. It'd be best if Democrats are the kind of political talent that could transcend the party. Uh, and Biden is perhaps alone at this moment in being that leader. Hmm. He's also brought uh, out of necessity a sense of restraint. He doesn't delight in the sound of his own voice. He leaves space for others, in particular Republicans, to reveal themselves. That carries costs. Francis Lee, a political scientist at Princeton, shown that when presidents take strong positions on issues, they generate enormous backlash. Biden's relative quiet is perhaps why his policy agendas remain more popular than he is and why there was so much room for voters to focus on the dangers of Republicans in the midterms, which, by the way, as it turns out in retrospect, was an absolutely brilliant strategy, which mm. they should bring forward into 2024. You have to focus on not that Ron DeSantis, you know, is a jerk or that Trump is a liar or Fox News lies about everything, which we'll get to. Yeah. You have to focus on the fact that what they're doing is going to affect you. It's your schools that are going to be screwed. It's your school library that's going to lose books for your kids to read. Your kids. Your kids are the ones that are going to lose the AP classes. Mm -hmm. Your kids are the ones that are going to be hurt. That's what they have to focus on. I Either can get behind that. Hard. Yeah, I mean, it has occurred. That's uh, just sort of stumbled into that myself just the uh, other day, realizing, you know, uh, watching all the books be banned and the AP courses being taken away and thinking, you know, Ron DeSantis climbed the ladder, got himself a Yale education, and now it's uh, F the rest of you, no education at all for any of you. Right. Then there's what Biden will have in 2024 he didn't have in 2020, our record largest infrastructure, climate science, technology investment. Unemployment, 3.4 percent, lowest level since 69. Inflation coming down. He's rallied a steady coalition against Russia. Look at today and helped Ukraine keep his resistance alive. He's turned Trump's incohate anger toward China into a suite of policies to make America and its allies less dependent on Chinese manufacturing. He's not gotten any younger, but he said a purchase on the present and an argument about the future that he didn't have in 2020 and went, which no other Democrat or Republican has now. Hmm. So. Typically, columns end on a point of certainty. Let me, as recline, sure, let's do it. instead end on a point of uncertainty. Oh. Age or accident could fail him tomorrow. 
I worry about how Biden will match up against the younger, more vigorous Republican than Trump. But the strength and purpose and substance of the reelection campaign you could run in 24 that was not there in 2020. And I've underestimated Biden before. Age matters. But so as Biden keeps showing, there's a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So a younger person is attacking an older person because of his age. And the older person says, well, fine, but I'm going to do the things you you kids want. (laughs) <laughs> and my peeps are going to get mad at you for attacking me for my age, and they're going to vote for me. And what are you going to do about it? Hmm. If, it if it works, it works. I mean, you know, if, if he runs against Trump, Trump's going to attack yeah. him because of his age? I don't think so. Well, he, he shouldn't. Uh, but uh, Trump is capable of doing something dumb like that, sure. But all right. Well, mm-hmm, I don't know. Uh, they'll have to find some kind of new line. That's That's for sure. Right. So, you know, interesting stuff. And then on top of it, you add his visit to keep today to point out the fact that, you know, he's doing things that you probably wanted him to do when you envisioned a generic Democrat Mm -hmm. being president. He's just doing it the Biden way, which may or may not annoy you. Yeah. Ice cream. You know, but he's doing it with ice cream. That's the point. That's that's pretty popular. And, uh, you know, uh, Cyclops X Men rays coming out of his eyes. <laughs> people are enjoying it, so, so okay. people are enjoying it. They're they're having a good time. There's pre- pretty Very good memes good. about that. Yeah. So uh, this is going to be a meme filled trip. Also ice cream, and by the way, he also subs Zelensky. So that's mm-hmm. all I have to say about that at the moment. All right, I think that should be sufficient. So uh, as I watched a little whirly sign on my computer oh. telling me that yeah this is really slow compared to where we were as we try to move on to the next topic oh my um here's some more uh detailed thinking about ukraine which since we're on the topic why don't we talk about this all right and you know part of the question is how does the ukraine war ultimately end this is from the harvard gazette oh and they know one year later how does the ukraine war end because it is one year later Russia's lost a reported 200,000 men. That is incredible. It's not just that. They've lost the entire structure of their army, right? They have this so-called offensive going on, Hmm. which really isn't working out particularly well for them. The only thing that's happening is that at the smaller – it's not an integrated uh, Air Force Mm -hmm. Army attack. You know, right. it's like, let's throw a brigade here, a division there. Hmm. Uh, but what happens is basically they throw them out there. And what they're throwing out are, are essentially prisoners conscripted by uh, the Wagner group. Yeah, and then they get that's killed. Great. But and that's their offense. It doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter to them. Hmm. It absolutely doesn't matter to them. But the point is. The Western press, uh, including the New York Times, has simply taken the approach that you can't stop Russia. Russia's unbeatable. They're just they can always throw stuff at you no matter what you do to them. Hmm. And in fact, they're getting slaughtered. And even the New York Times, even the New York Times had to step back and say, you know what? This uh, vaunted offensive uh, isn't really working. Hmm. We should stop (laughs) vaunting the Russians. I guess, yeah. Yeah, it's taken a toll. It, it takes a toll on Ukrainians because people get killed and their their cities get destroyed. But the Wagner Group is, uh. has lost like, uh, you know, 90% of their people. Hmm. 200,000 well. men. They they invaded with 200,000 people. Oh. Hmm, so we've just sort and of so erased far, that. One year later, Russia's lost a reported 200,000 people, hmm. including high-ranking military officials. Yes, How do you consider true. that a win? Uh, I mean, I basically, know. if you, you were at risk, you'd be off the board. Yes. And they're playing it, I guess, like risk, just dropping brigades here and there. I think it would go well here. Let's try it. Right. Hmm. So, uh, you know, the banking and trade sanctions that the U.S. and Europe have imposed are only now starting to bite. Retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling one mm-hmm. of the better experts to follow. So the biggest challenge for the Ukrainian army will be quickly integrating all the different weapon systems that they're getting from Western allies. The spring will be a race between Russian mobilization and the transformation of Ukraine's army. Hmm. Putin okay. has made an active decision to mobilize forces to the front lines, getting as many bodies into this 
in an attempt to retake ground. And so missile attacks and uh, strikes against Ukraine's infrastructure will continue. But, uh, you know, the other thing is that Putin's agenda, which is to wipe out Ukraine as a society, will most certainly outlast the Putin regime, said Natalia Bogayova, hmm. a Ukrainian national security analyst. All the conversations about ceasefires, premature peace deals, negotiations, they're not off-ramps for the Kremlin. They're delayed on-ramps to pursue the same objective, just under better circumstances. So given that, uh, the thing that Putin feared most was Ukraine drifting closer to the EU and a stronger, more unified NATO. And both have come to pass, and more so. Uh, True. So basically, Putin's losing, even if he's transforming Russia into the autocratic state he envisioned. Yes, which is another we're certainly story. losing yeah, in Ukraine, today. and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can't help him domestically either. But yeah, he must be—he must have one eye on uh, his own exit at some point. How he, how he's going to escape, or what he's leaving behind, or whether anybody will let him live out his natural life. Well, you know, he—I I think he's an ill person. I, I don't mean mentally mm. ill. I mean like he has something. You, you know, he has this tremor that doesn't go away. He can't talk to people without his feet dancing while mm. he's sitting. You know, something's going on there. All right. In any case, a different expert, Phillips O'Brien, writing in his newsletter over the weekend, Weekend Update 16, Uh, Russia's massive offensive is a sign of declining efficiency, losing more to take less. Mm. And so in the beginning, you may recall, Russia moved relatively quickly from the south toward the north, which was an offensive that essentially failed. And now what happens is they have this massive offensive which gains, you know, a couple of kilometers and then loses. Yeah. Okay. No. Right? Yeah. This, is, uh, this, this change in tone, he says, from... even he's noticed, this change in tone might be best seen in the New York Times, which provided this analysis of the failure of the Russian army in attempting to take uh, Vulidar. Okay. Moscow's military capabilities are in question after failed battle for Ukrainian city. That's the headline in the Times. Okay. The assault reveals, Phillips O'Brien writes, that instead of military learning, the Russian military continues to suffer from major shortcomings stretching from the top of the strategic decision-making tree. Putin, remember, a nation's mm-hmm. grand strategy rots from the head down and reaching to the functioning of its small infantry units. It's not worth cataloging them here, but there are so many. It points out the fact that the Russian military doesn't seem to be learning terribly efficiently, if at all, unlike it has been claimed to by some analysts. And at the same time, it's struggling mightily in attempting complex operations. And by the way, this is what I'm trying to develop in my midweek, uh, mm. you have to pay for them, uh, Substack analyses. But luckily for you, mm. I pay for them, so I get to read them. Hey, all right. Thanks this for week, paying. I will build on the last by trying to give a detailed discussion of what military learning looks like. By examining strategic bombing in World War II, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but the point is what you're supposed to do is try something, and if it doesn't succeed, you learn from that, and then you do it differently. Russia appears to be incapable of Hmm. that. Yeah, well, I don't know how many options they have and how adept the training for new ones they have, and and I I don't know. I uh, Well, there's a... There's an awful lot going on. I don't know what's going on, of course, in the top brass there. All I know is that we occasionally find out that they fall out of windows, and I don't know. Maybe that has something to do with the the learning curve or people just being uh, overly cautious uh, because they don't want to fall out a window. Or, but, yeah, there's no way for me to analyze this. That's just not my area. It's just, I have to just watch and watch the so-called experts uh, make their best guesses. Right. Hmm. So uh, the other big story of the week is that there was this, uh, as far as Ukraine goes, is the Munich uh, Security Conference, München Security Conference. Oh, okay. Where Kamala Harris went and said, you know what, uh, Russia's guilty of war crimes. Yes, she did say that. Uh, And to all those who have perpetrated those crimes and to their superiors who are complicit in those crimes, you will be held to account, she said. Guess so. I don't know when or where. But at the same time, you know, diplomacy is always uh, the the less sophisticated might simply call it two faced. Uh, Mm. The more sophisticated might say, well, it's nuanced and layered. (laughs) But it comes out that Blinken also said on a phone call that Crimea might be a red line for Russia and maybe not be returned to Ukraine. General Mm. Milley, who's always been more skeptical 
about Ukraine being able to retake Crimea militarily said uh, Russia-Ukraine war will end with negotiations. So there we have it. I would say these are the two big stories of the week, right, Phillips O'Brien, the military analyst. Russian efficiency is declining as an offensive force and the Biden administration's ideas and an eventual peace deal, while seeming a little scattered, are actually coming into focus. Hmm, okay. So uh, it's Oof. nice to see an end of the war. All wars end in negotiation. Unless yeah, you're going to completely like... wipe out somebody off the face of the earth, right. which generally doesn't happen. You don't bomb right. them back to you the Stone Age. Uh, so I don't know what any of that you means. But avoid. if somebody can actually see the end of the war in the uh, uh, the front windshield window, that's a great thing. You can always see it through the uh, rearview yes. mirror, but you know, at the time, it's really hard to see how all of this comes together. But if they can start seeing the beginning of this, you know, a lot of that's going to be due to the fact that the the vaunted Russian military is actually pretty bad at what it does. Yeah, it's good at destroying things. I guess so, but it's bad at winning. Uh, yeah, I suppose they're they, in the end. You could say they're <clears throat> they're fine at once. They've gotten a hold of something sitting on top of it. If Crimea is the thing you have in mind they, that's an interesting point they may end up with uh, a uh, negotiated peace that ends the open hostilities elsewhere but doesn't uh, uh, return you uh, uh, crimea well, it to settle. it's not going to be settled business yeah uh, yeah okay and at the same time uh, russia's never going to stop wanting to destroy ukraine so you can't fix everything with a final settlement and besides final no. solutions are kind of a grim way oh, to yeah, think about true. anything right especially in munich if you think about it okay so uh yeah they'll move elsewhere before they start contemplating that i would think well right uh, and when we get huh. back from the break we're gonna do a little american problem oh okay I, is there any we'll find oh, out there's plenty i heard there was so. okay great two minutes until we return home Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue our second segment. Greg Dworkin still here. The computer is trying to run away, but he's uh, sitting on top of it. And uh, making sure it doesn't squirm out of the room, apparently. Okay. Well, you know, there's still a lot going on and a lot politically. In fact, there's even a lot going on presidentially uh, when you consider that uh, announcement over the weekend that uh, Jimmy Carter, the greatest ex-president we ever had, is uh, in hospice and will not be long for this world. Mm. That's what it means to be in hospice. Yes. In in his case, he's he's 98. He's had some issues, including with cancer. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said and there'll be a lot that's going to be said. Uh, But for the purposes of this show. Yes. Question is whether Donald Trump's going to be invited to the funeral. No. Yeah. Well, no, no no state funerals for Trump, not even going to other people's state. Uh, Well, you know, it's been a topic of yours and I'm not wishing ill on Jimmy Carter. uh, But, uh, you know, the news is what the news is. And I think we all have to get used to the fact that, uh, Mm. you know, he's in hospice and what that means. Yeah. So that's a big story. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of incredible things said about Jimmy Carter and what a good man he was. And they're all true. Yeah. We're only only belatedly finding out uh, what we missed out on. And and, and if you find that offensive, let me just say uh, what a good man he is. Okay. Yes. Well, he also was one. And he's continuing. And, you know, okay. I get you. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, now, meanwhile, uh, here's Rolling Stone. Oh. Uh, Aswin uh, Sobsang, Swin, reporting with Adam Ronsley. 
Charges against Trump lawyer, very likely oh. colleagues warn Oh, Donald. I see it. Yeah. All right. A, a Trump Not lawyer? Donald. Well, as the feds continue to probe the ex president's handling of confidential documents, his legal team is urging him to distance himself from one of his top attorneys. The <laughs> Trump administration is taking the point of view, interestingly enough, that Evan Corcoran, who's one of the top attorneys trying to defend him against the Mar a Lago probe, yeah. is himself in legal jeopardy because there's this grand jury going on. And Evan Corcoran is the one that wrote the report that, uh, uh, Christine Bob signed that said, yeah. yeah, we looked and there's nothing here. Right. Well, yeah. then he was lying. Uh, yes. Because obviously he didn't look because there was a lot there. Mm -hmm. So that makes him uh, part of a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, attorney client privilege exception. Oh, the crime, crime. fraud exception? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah if it's a, yeah. He committed he's... a crime because he had to know. Yeah. He's either lying or he's think. stupid. Uh, and so he's in big trouble. But the Trump people are saying, no, he's not in trouble at all. We didn't do anything wrong. And this huh. is because Jack Smith and, and Merrick Garland have no case and their case is so weak. They're trying to get the lawyers who are successfully defending Trump fired. That's what's going on here. Really. Hmm. Huh. Um, is it working? <laughs> These types of motions, writes the article. Requesting that a judge nullify attorney-client privilege based on the crime-fraud exception hmm. would only be served upon the attorneys who have appeared in the case. Jim Trusty, what a name, Honest John's <laughs> used cars, John Rowley, Evan Corcoran, Tim Parlator, and Lindsay Halligan. Hmm. The five of them would be the only people who have access really to the documents as a person familiar with the internal proceedings of Trump's legal team. Any source other than that wouldn't be speaking from a position of access. Mm -hmm. Furthermore... When DOJ targets lawyers, it's often being done from a position of weakness in their underlying case as a method of undermining the integrity of the defendant's legal team. Removal of Evan Corcoran would serve the purpose of giving DOJ exactly what it wanted. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I think that's, that's all right if they got what they wanted, I suppose. Uh, hmm. Well, I mean. So I love this quote, and I'll let you guess who said it. Okay. If Evan Corcoran doesn't recognize that Donald cares for no one but himself and is more than willing to let him take the fall, he would be a fool. Oh, boy. Could be anybody. Uh, Michael said Cohen. Michael said Cohen. That. Oh. Yes. <laughs> you got it right. Trump's former All attorney right. and fixer tells Rolling Stone. Personally, right. I don't see Evan as such. Hmm. So uh, if Evan's not a fool, then uh, basically he turns state's evidence. Oh. So or we'll a fool see. guy. It's really interesting. Because attorneys like to get money, and they like to win clients, and they like to win cases, and they like the notoriety. Sure. They don't like to go to jail. No, most people seek to avoid that. Huh. All right. Well, that's uh, it, it's it's uh, fine. I don't know. There's a large collection of Trump lawyers who are in legal trouble now, and I suppose he could... You know, he could take some comfort in that. He's uh, in, in notorious company, if not good company. But uh, jail's jail. I don't know. Well, you know, but the goes. interesting thing there, right, is to step back and take a look and say, where is this going? And there are people who say, well, Trump will never be indicted. Yeah. Well, I don't know that. I mean, he's. I think he's in trouble in Georgia, and I think he's in trouble in a couple of other cases. And uh, there was a case that David French, of all people, made in the Atlantic that, uh, you know, there's separate things going on between Georgia and Mar-a-Lago and whatever happened on January 6th. He's in big trouble. Whatever he's going to be indicted. But, you know, uh, short of that, until you see it, you're not going to believe it. Yeah. It sure looks like people around him are going to be indicted. Yeah, I mean, I'll take it. And well, sometimes once it they're leads, indicted, yeah. you know, some of them will flip. I guess so. You know, we'll see how flippy they are or what they have. You know, some and, do like Michael Cohen and uh -huh. some don't like Roger Stone. Yeah, right. I mean, or Paul Manafort. Yeah, there's no pardons in the offing yet. But there's no pardons in the offing here. So it's a big difference. That's exactly right. That's the point I was getting to. Oh. What makes this so different? Well, Trump's not around to pardon him. Yeah. Now you're not so brave. Right, right. And uh, it's a long wait, even if you believe fully that he will uh, run and win in 2024. That's a long time to wait for your pardon. Right. So, okay. So, uh, hmm. let's turn again to the states and a little bit more politics here. Uh, you want to do Michigan or Wisconsin? 
Mm, uh, Michigan. Michigan. They're, they're so let's start with a conservative All right. columnist, oh. op-ed editor for the Detroit News. His name is Nolan Finley. All right. And I'm citing him not let's because him. I think he's especially uh, sharp in terms of his uh, point of view. Uh, I usually disagree with most of his columns. Hmm. But right. what's, consi- what's important is that he's a conservative. Self-described. I, I, I am the was... conservative uh, okay. editor of the op-ed page of the Detroit, Detroit News, he says. <laughs> Destroit. Okay. Destroit yeah. News. The D- distraught News. Is like... <laughs> okay. Uh, well, he's distraught. Look at his column. Yes. I... With Caramo as chair, oh. it's RIP Michigan GOP, oh. he writes. Okay. Oh, all right. I know what the story is. Okay. Yes. Michigan Republicans stage a spectacular demolition derby Saturday. This Again, this is written from a conservative's point of view. Scattering the wreckage of their party across the floor of the Lansing Center. Hmm. Now, for those of you who want some sort of parallel on the Democratic side, you have to, I suppose, look at Nevada and the takeover of the Reed machine by the Bernie people. Okay where the party was like totally wrecked compared to what it was like five minutes ago. Oh, I like, see. Is that good or is that bad? Well, the huge difference here, and you have to keep this in mind, is that the Reed machine sort of went in exile, did their own thing, and helped with the election mm-hmm. their own way. There is no such structure in Michigan for Republicans. Okay. So Michigan Republicans staged a spectacular demolition derby Saturday scattering the wreckage of their party across the floor of the Lansing Center. When it was over, half or more of them walked out of the hall angry and believing they'd been robbed, the chronic condition of Republicans <laughs> these days. Yes. And yet, despite the destruction they'd wrought, most were also convinced beyond all reason they were marching off on a righteous crusade to take back Michigan and America. Bless their hearts. Yes. They have no idea. Everybody take it back. Whatever it is, take it back and take it in opposite directions. So this conservative writes in electing Christina Caramo as party chair, who, by yes. the way, is so right wing. She was to the right of the Trump person currently under investigation, uh, yeah, uh, Matt DiPerno. Yeah, those were the two contestants. Those uh, are the two contestants. She's way to the right of him. He lost. He had had been Trump endorsed to for this for this race. For, for this purpose. Uh, yeah. They've solidified Democratic oh. control of this state for years to come. Before the vote, awesome. businessman Kevin Rinke, the failed 2022 GOP gubernatorial hopeful, said if anybody except political consultant and establishment favorite Scott Greenlee was elected chair, we lose in 24, 26 and whatever. Oh, well, the, the exact quote that. is we lose in 24, 26 is at risk. That's an optimistic forecast. The state GOP is flat broke, so busted it may not be able to hold its biennial gathering this fall in Mackinac Island. Right, right. With Karamo as chair, the doors of the well teal donors will be closed, not to mention their checkbooks. She couldn't raise money for her own disastrous Secretary of State campaign last fall, where she lost in a blowout. How can she expect to fundraise for the party? And how can she promote candidates when she only rarely talks to the press? Respectable mm. business people who have always bankrolled the party want nothing to do with Karamo, who embodies the paranoia and bitterness of the GOP base. They can't afford the hit to their reputation. Ironically, in picking her over Greenlee and Trump endorsed Matt DiPerno, the delegates rejected not only the party establishment, they also rejected the Trump wing. Yes. Now there's no place to go for money. No. Uh, Those are the two hmm. groups of the party that have money. I guess so. With her decision... These, with their decision, these delegates have killed the Michigan Republican Party as a political home for principled conservatives, hoping to mount a counteroffensive oh, to ruinous progressive policies. Ooh. It's officially a fringe outfit now. How are we supposed to get back at Big Wretch, he says. He frets. He, hmm. you know, distraught news. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, you won't. But, you know, what can I tell you? You did. You, you wrecked the party. I did. I, I saw this story uh, not his version of it but uh, over the weekend that so i guess somehow uh diperno was the one that was endorsed by trump for party chair both uh diperno and Caram- caramo had just run for statewide office and gotten slaughtered so you know they needed something to do but i guess diperno acknowledged his loss he conceded his race it, you know, he lost by you know i don't know 
almost 10 points or something. And uh, But Caramo lost by an even larger margin in her race for Secretary of State, but she refused to concede. And so the dynamic, as I understand it, on the, on the convention floor was DiPerno got Trump's endorsement, but he's a sellout and a rhino because he conceded his race. And he, you know, he abandoned those of us who believed that the race was stolen. And they all went to Caramo, who got beaten even worse, but said she won. So, okay, good luck. I, I hope it works out for you, or yeah, I really hope luck. it doesn't. Good it's, luck. So, anyway, that's what's lying. going on in Michigan. And yeah. uh, huh. meanwhile... Okay, Wisconsin was the other one. Well, there's a third. We'll do Florida, oh. too. But oh, uh, okay. Wisconsin, uh, we got a, uh, an okay. election tomorrow. Oh, well, wake Explain up, Explain the Wisconsin Supreme Court race. Oh, okay. And yes. by the way, if you're from Wisconsin, how to register to vote. I asked in Wisconsinites just to clarify this for me. Okay. Okay, we have two very good Democratic judges running for one slot, which is the mm-hmm. Democratic uh, primary uh, side, except that this is a jungle primary, so like top two vote getters win. But there's two Democrats running, both of whom are very good. Yeah. And there's two Republicans running, both of whom are very bad. All right. Now, it's expected that the top two vote getters will be one Democrat and one Republican. We don't know who. But All it's right. possible that the top two vote getters could be two Democrats. Oh, all right. It's always possible, uh, but not likely. What's more likely is that it'll be a traditional runoff than in April for I that see. slot between a Democrat and Republican. And whoever the Republican is is going to be conservative and very bad and keep the Wisconsin Supreme Court conservative in a state where a lot of stuff's coming up for debate and discussion and rulings. Mm -hmm. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court is extraordinarily political. So it's a very important race, and we'll see how it goes tomorrow. Yes. Or as the uh, University of Wisconsin LaSalle Student News Service says, Despite the race being a nonpartisan election, candidates Jennifer Doro and Daniel Kelly are viewed as Republican supported conservatives, and candidates Everett Mitchell and Janet uh, Protaswitz are viewed as Democrat supported liberals. According okay. to guides.vote, conservative justices currently have a four to three majority on the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and this race could either sustain or flip the court. Mm. According to the University of Wisconsin Madison Law School, Associate Professor Robert Yablon, this is an extremely high stakes state Supreme Court race. Some of the cases taken up by the court are likely to create an interest in the race throughout the country. One issue will be is the uh, 1849 abortion ban at the year 1849. 1849. Likewise, other controversial wow. topics could appear before the court, such as LGBTQ rights and affirmative action. Now, one of the Republican supported conservatives running for the seat is Jennifer Doro. According to her official website, she's a judicial conservative who will not legislate from the bench. Oh, sure. uh, and uh, the term legislating from the bench describes a Supreme Court justice who favors partisanship over legal precedence. Hmm. That's a nice way of describing it. Additionally, her website states she's been serving as a Waukesha County circuit cut court judge for more than 11 years. So clearly she's crucial. Yeah. After being appointed by Scott Walker. Oh, during an interview with uh, WISN 12 News, uh, Dara was asked, uh, I, I always look at this and say, KW, I guess it's the W. w yeah. do you, what do you see the court's role in major policy issues like abortion, redistricting? And yeah. she said, a judge at its core should be someone who interprets the law and applies the law to the facts. Before her legal career, she graduated from Marquette and attended law school at Regent University School of Law, mm. where she earned her JD. Sort of. Uh, so uh, Dora stated that the decision in the U.S. Supreme Court case Lawrence versus Texas. Yes. Which is a, uh, a case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2003 that raised the constitutional question, do the criminal convictions of John Lawrence and Tyron Garner under the Texas homosexual conduct law, mm-hmm. which criminalizes sexual intimacy by the same sex couple, but not identical behavior by a different sex couple, violate the 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection of laws? The court ruled that the Texas statute making it a crime for two persons of the same sex to engage in certain intimate sexual conduct violates due process. She said that's a prime example of judicial activism at its worst. 
Just want to give you perspective as to who she is. Mm. The second Republican supported conservative running for the open seat is Daniel Kelly. According to Kelly's website, he'll preserve constitutional rights, uphold the rule of law and prevent judicial activism. Oh. His website states his opponents are judicial activists who seek to impose their own political agenda on our state. According to guides.vote, Kelly's previously clerked on the Wisconsin Court of Appeals and U.S. Court of Federal Claims, where he served as a staff attorney. Walker appointed Kelly to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, where he served until 2020. Kelly graduated from Carroll University and earned his J.D. from Regent University School of Law. On LGBTQ rights, Kelly said the legalization of same-sex marriage is, quote, an illegitimate exercise of state power, unquote. Wonderful. Did you right. say they were both from Regent University? Yeah, wow. yeah. According no to Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, uh, Sentinel, Kelly wrote a blog post in 2012 stating the Democratic Party and National Organization for Women were, quote, committed to normalizing taking the life of human beings. Oh. He also said we may safely charge them with knowingly favoring a policy that has as its primary purpose harming children. Why? To preserve sexual libertinism. Hmm. He's, He's endorsed really by the Pro-Life it. Wisconsin Victory Fund. So that's who's running on the Republican side. In touch kind of guy, hip to the kids. Yeah. All right. Here's that's another on news. affirmative action. Kelly said affirmative action and slavery differ, obviously. <laughs> Thank you. But but it's more a question of degree good. than principle. I see. For they both spring from the same taproot. Morally and as a matter of law, they are the same. Oh, wow. Okay. okay, so that's who's running, and yeah, this matters. Up How and do you down think spring from the same tapper, too. Yeah, all right. Uh, we I can talk know. about the Democrats, but let me just tell you, they're like normal people who think normal things. But I can give you details. Them. Sure, I don't know. I, 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 is that... Should we? <laughs> are we shortchanging them not to say how normal they are? Oh, well, let's talk about normal. All right. According to his official website, Everett Mitchell was elected to the Dane County Circuit Court and presides over the juvenile division in Branch 4 during his tenure. He's worked with colleagues to change courtroom policies to reflect trauma-informed practices, such as removing restraints and handcuffs on youths during hearings. All right. He's provided a bridge for youth involved in the criminal justice system's educational programming. He also has a Master of Divinity and a Master of Theology from Princeton oh. and a JD from UW-Madison Law School. On LGBTQ rights, Mitchell became the first pastor of a black Baptist church to marry same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. According right, to guides.vote, Mitchell's that endorsements means. include former Democratic Governor Jim Doyle, former Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice Lewis Butler, Madison Police Chief Sean Barnes, okay. and Dane County Sheriff Calvin Barrett, along with judges, other police chiefs, and elected officials. So that's a pretty nice good record. Election. Yeah, and he's more wisconsin -y than the others. The second Democratic-supported liberal running for the Wisconsin Supreme Court is Janet uh, Pro Protasiewicz. I don't know. Before running for the Wisconsin Supreme Court, she earned her bachelor's degree from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and her JD from Marquette, where she later served as an Wisconsin. adjunct professor, according to Guides.Vote. She's worked as a Milwaukee County Assistant District Attorney for more than 25 years, and then in 2014 was elected to the Milwaukee County Circuit Court, where she currently serves in family court. On LGBTQ rights, she says, we know it's not up to the government to decide who we can or can't love. In addition to independence, you bring your values to the court every day, values leading me to believe that a woman's right to make decisions over her own body should be just that, not made by the government, but made by the person who's ultimately, ultimately being affected by them. Um, so her endorsements include current Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice Rebecca Dallet, bricklayers and allied craft workers of Wisconsin, UAW, and American Federation of Teachers. Okay. Very traditionally Democratic in the uh, endorsement department. Both, right. Both so both Wisconsin very, very grads, solid though. people, whereas yeah. the Republicans are who I said they were and mm. who you think they are. Yeah. And uh, the uh, early vote's over. It, it ended on the 19th. And uh, then the election is tomorrow with the top two vote getters going on to the general election in April. So everybody's watching. All right. Well, now ben you know Wickler, who is the head of the Wisconsin uh, Democratic Party, said this is the most important election that nobody ever heard of. But, of course, you've heard of it now. Yes, now. And, he, and he's done a good job of making sure everybody heard of it. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you mentioned it, I said, ah, you know, uh, now I know why I didn't really 
realize what you meant when you said an election tomorrow, but oh, Wisconsin, I'm not from Wisconsin, but yeah, oh, absolutely. I've seen it mentioned. Uh, do you get to, uh, do you get to, to cast just one That's vote? That's funny you should slot? say that. I asked all my Wisconsin friends that question mm, because in okay. Connecticut, for example, if we're having a local election and let's say we're electing the equivalent of our town council mm -hmm. and there's six slots, you get to vote for two. Yeah. No, you get to vote for one person. All right. Oh, that's uh, okay. Well, that'll be interesting to see how you make your choices there. But you got two good ones, so you can't go too far wrong. You, yeah, you'd and be then you a, have the Republicans. Yeah, right. They, and you just discount them, and then you make a, a nice choice between two good people. Yep. Anyway. Hmm. Well, sorry but that's about not all the those only uh, interesting things at the state level. Of course, uh, we know about Ron DeSantis, and maybe we'll do him Wednesday because we don't really have time to do him justice today with the oh. amount of time that we have left. All right, let's do him an injustice. But Florida, yes, Florida is a DeSantis state, right? Uh, that's the one I know of. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yesterday, the Republican Party of Florida Politico reports elected a new chair for the 2024 cycle. All right. In what some supporters of Governor Ron DeSantis fear is a giant Florida win for Trump. Hmm. Oh, Christian yes, Ziegler defeated Evan Power in the vote 126 to 100, and Power was selected as vice chair. Ziegler, quote, has worked closely with Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski. Ziegler's <laughs> wife, Bridget, is the co-founder of the conservative parental rights organization Moms for Liberty. Oh, boy. Yeah, all right. You know who they are. They yeah. work on school crap. Right. And was endorsed by DeSantis in her race for Sarasota County School Board. Trump's right. team did nothing to downplay the proxy war perception after the vote. They report chair races across the country are and should be important for people running for president, said a consultant familiar with the Trump campaign's thinking. The person was granted anonymity to freely discuss the race. To that extent, the more Trump candidate won today, that means the Trump campaign is likely pleased with the outcome, hmm. even though Trump wasn't MAGA enough in Michigan. Right. Okay. Hmm. So you have these two uh, uh, parties moving in different directions. DeSantis yes. and uh, Trump are still circling each other. And uh, in the amount of time we have left, with, which isn't very much, I'm going to mention here two things. One is a really, really interesting focus group. Uh, run by the Bulwark's Sarah Longwell, who does these things, hmm. along with Tara Palmieri, who is a political analyst for Puck. Okay, who doesn't who, do these things. Who covers both Trump and DeSantis' world. Yeah, oh, eventually they'll have to pick one or the other, I guess. Yeah, but for now, has been hmm. covering both and, and knows both. And they talk to uh, focus group Republicans. And the long and the short of it is essentially everybody understands that at these uh, Republicans in their focus group, everybody understands that they've lost, that it's really important to win, that Ron DeSantis has a glass jaw, but they don't want Trump to hit it. Hmm. That's the interesting thing. Hmm. They really get mad when Trump starts to tear at the DeSantis because they see DeSantis as their best chance of winning if he's the nominee. I guess so. It's well, not that they've the deserted Trump. Yes. They still like what he stands for. They don't like him personally, but they never have. That's not the point. Lots of Republicans don't like Trump personally, but still voted for him because of what re he represents. And if he were the nominee, they'd vote for him again. But in the process of the run-up, they really get mad when he goes after DeSantis. Yeah. Which is a, a big danger signal for Trump because, as they like to say, that's how he rolls. Yeah. For sure, and uh, and I'm sure that he thinks he can roll past them too. And I don't know that that's really true. I mean, it could be a terrific situation. Everybody so you have that strength. concept plus the uh, party chair favoring Trump in Florida, hmm. and you have a really interesting situation where DeSantis isn't, uh, you know, the juggernaut that everybody makes him out to be. It's not that he's not dangerous; he's terrible. Yeah. But he's not inevitable is what I'm trying to say. So this next piece okay. is actually from The Hill. GOP impatience grows for DeSantis to make the move on Trump. DeSantis wants to wait till May. And mm. the rest of the GOP is saying, you're losing momentum, dude. It's going to be him if you don't get on the stick and do something and do huh. it now. What's he supposed to do? Just declare? Fight back. Get up there. Fight. Declare oh, yourself. Okay. Start running. 
DeSantis's absence in the field, it says, creates an opening for other Republicans to jump in and command attention for a few news cycles, including yeah. people like Nikki Haley or Mike Pence or Didn't Tim work. Scott. And, of course, the divided party is only going to let Trump win. And that's so true, it, but... it's a really complicated dynamic here. On the one hand, the more people that run, the better for Trump. And on the other hand, uh, you know, people really don't like Trump and they'd really like to see somebody else. And they'd rather it be Ron DeSantis, who's dangerous. And how is that all going to play out? And we don't know. Mm. All right. Wow. Well, yeah, I, I suppose it pays. And then again, uh, Trump mm. might be indicted. Oh, yeah. Maybe and then he's again, people don't like it when Trump takes swings at DeSantis. So it's pretty complicated. All right. I'm surprised even that uh, the, it's not a situation in Florida where the a sitting Republican governor would be allowed to appoint the chair. Right. Or, I mean, or, I don't think know, it works in any of the states, actually, but here, on the national level, it kind of works He's, he's way, got right? enough uh, uh, juice there. He's got enough yeah. power to basically run the colleges. Right. Yes. But he no. can't even get his own chair. Right. He has to wait for all of these college kids to graduate and become Republican delegates in order for it to work. Uh, even that's that interesting, weird? the one area that he doesn't have that much control. But uh, there, too, you would think, OK, even if he doesn't have actual control, he should have nominal control and and let people know that uh, you're going to the convention to do this voting. We're going to make your lives miserable. He's an authoritarian. So I'm going to make your lives miserable unless you elect my guy. Uh, but they said, we're already miserable. We live in Florida. What's the difference, I guess? Right. And anyway, there you the have rest. it. We got through the hour, and my machine, uh, cranky though it is, uh, you know, limped along and got us to where we need to be. Right. It only needs a little more hydrogen to keep going, and uh, I guess, or solar. <laughs> How do you power this thing? Gerbil hamsters. On a wheel? We need hamsters. <laughs> I guess that's good. Send out for take. hamsters. All right. Amazon. It worked. But uh, yeah, good. Well, thank you. I'm glad to, we uh, had you back after a, a, what seemed like a lengthy absence. I, I didn't but... want to be away, but I had no choice. Yes. Right. Well, Apple did it, and the supply chain is holding you hostage. But but uh, your uh, your regular computer eventually comes back. The, di- the That's what prognosis they say. is good. And okay. I sure hope so, because it's a pretty good computer. I like it. Very good. All right. And it's well. got all my stuff on it. Yeah, well, we need to have that stuff. Okay, well, I'm glad this one worked. Uh, it'll, it's a good Band-Aid for now. Thanks for coming by, and uh, we'll check in again on Wednesday. That the, we will. The big computer will be back by then or no? Maybe Biden will go to Moscow. All right, welcome back now to the k Garner Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. So much happening. How How do we even follow that up? Well... With more news about those things, I guess. I uh, put aside over the weekend the Washington Post story about the uh, uh, Michigan Republican Party chair's race. Uh, This one has a little more detail of just how strange, kooky, dangerous the candidates were. And in particular, the candidate who won. This is Isaac Arnsdorf writing... For the post, far right election denier beats Trump's pick for Michigan GOP. You know how we like to say it here on the show. And of course, um, that probably strikes you as an odd construction of the uh, headline only because you're probably assuming that Trump's pick for Michigan GOP would also be a far right election denier. And he kind of is. He just neglected to deny the outcome of his own election, but I think he was probably pretty active in denying the outcome of Trump's election, and that's how he got to be Trump's pick for the party. But it doesn't matter because he was defeated by somebody who doesn't believe in any elections and and then won an election. That's weird. (laughs) Anyway, Christina Caramo is... What we're saying is the pronunciation of the name of the person who won this race. Uh, the subheader tells us that Caramo refused to concede her run for secretary of state. And then she beat Donald Trump's choice for state chair in a chaotic convention. And uh, here's what they have to tell you about her. Uh, Republicans here reeling from a midterm election route that many blamed on the influence of former President Donald Trump. Remember, Michigan flipped everything, right? And then they they ended up with a trifecta for Democrats for the first time in quite a while. And many Republicans there blamed Trump and the fallout 
uh, among voters uh, uh, from his craziness, essentially. And I guess they wanted to distance themselves from Trump. But interestingly, the the of the two leading candidates for Michigan party chair, there was the Trump endorsed one. And I mean, how are you going to, you know, distance yourself from Trump if you believe that it was his fault that you lost so many races in Michigan? Uh, what do you do if there's a Trump endorsed candidate and then a crazier candidate than that? I don't know. But I guess there was a third candidate that uh, that that Greg mentioned, who I guess was just never really in the running. It was just a question of which of these two lunatics is going to win, the Trump-endorsed lunatic or the more Trumpy than Trump lunatic. And guess what? Michigan did, uh, and I guess signaling, uh, heralding what, what comes in the future. If re- Michigan Republicans are right, and that columnist that we read from the distraught news <laughs> Was also, is also right. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can see how people could come to the conclusion that the Republican Party of Michigan is destroyed forever if, you know, normal Republicans think the real reason we lost all these seats and lost all these races was the influence of Donald Trump. Uh, and the only thing to do was then to turn the dial from 11 to 12 somehow. Uh, gosh, I guess that means they're done, but... You know, I'll wait and see. I'll I'll hope for good results and see if it happens. But anyway, uh, here's more detail about what's going on with these folks. Uh, Republicans, of course, reeling from a route that they blame on or many blame on Donald Trump's influence, responded on Saturday somehow by spurning the former president's choice for state party chair. That part makes sense. And choosing someone even more extreme. That part does not make as much sense. Christina Caramo, who refused to concede her 14-point loss for Secretary of State in 2022, beat former Attorney General candidate Matt DiPerno, who had Trump's endorsement, in three rounds of contentious voting. The chaotic 11-hour convention, featuring a rowdy standoff over voting procedures and 10 candidates who all ran under a pro-Trump banner, left no doubt that the bulk of the party's activists in this key battleground state remain firmly committed to election denial and showed no interest in moderating their message to appeal to the political center. Conceding to a fraudulent person is agreeing with the fraud, which I will not do, Caramo said to cheers in her campaign speech on Saturday. The outcome also dealt a tactical defeat to Trump, even though all the candidates competed for aligning themselves with him. Many delegates said they discounted or even resented Trump's involvement in the race, especially after a midterm cycle that saw widespread wrangling over his down-ballot endorsements in that state. We love Donald Trump, but he don't live here, said Mark Fortin, another candidate for chair who ended up endorsing Caramo. In a Thursday speech to a right-wing so-called patriot group in nearby Charlotte, Caramo argued that, among other things, Christianity belonged at the core of American politics. She called evolution one of the biggest frauds ever perpetuated on society. Not perpetrated on society, but rather perpetuated on society. That's what she said. And, of course, uh, of course, I say, of course, asserted the existence of demons. Well, sure, everyone's asserting the existence of demons these days. You got to do it. It's like de rigueur, as they say. Uh, well, this sounds new, actually. When we start talking about the spiritual reality of the demonic forces, spiritual reality, okay, uh, it's like, Oh my God, this is crazy. We can't go there, Caramo said. Okay, yes, right. You're right, Christina. You can't go there. No, it's like, did you read the Bible? Didn't Jesus perform exorcisms? Scriptures are clear. And so if we're not operating as though the spirit realities of the world exist, the spirit realities, it's some kind of loony code, I guess. Uh, we're going to fail every time. And uh, 
you know, you're invited to fail every time. I mean, that's fine with me. I, I don't mind if you if you do. But I guess so. If you don't, if you deny the existence, the literal existence of demons and demonic possession, then we're gonna fail and lose every time. Oh, hmm. well, golly. Uh, okay, so that's interesting. She recognizes that people think it's crazy to go there. But she says, uh, sorry, we have to. Didn't you read the Bible? We have to be crazy. In 2022, Democrats swept statewide races in Michigan and won control of both legislative chambers, achieving full statewide control for the first time since the 1980s. In 2024, the state is poised to host early primary contests and be a competitive presidential and Senate battleground. Do I think it destroyed the state party? For sure, Christine Barnes, an unsuccessful state House candidate who skipped this year's convention, said of Trump's interventions, and the party is a hot mess right now. Yikes. The outcome here Saturday underscores the stark reality confronting Republicans across the country. Months after general election, voters across the country rejected extreme election-denying candidates such as Caramo, DiPerno, and former Arizona gubernatorial nominee Carrie Lake, many party activists remain enthralled by them. Some Republicans have voiced concern that this trend could set the party back at the ballot box in future races. Lake, who has yet to concede defeat in Arizona and has waged an unsuccessful legal fight to challenge the results of her 2022 race, has been traveling the country promoting false election claims as she weighs a run for U.S. Senate in 2024. And Trump, in his third run for president, continues to promote false claims about the 2020 election. Trump held a tele-rally for DiPerno on Monday. That was un unlikely to be successful, if you ask me. Calling him a defender of election integrity, DiPerno rose to prominence as a lawyer chasing conspiracy theories in Michigan's 2020 election. A Republican state Senate report faulted him for spreading misinformation, a Republican report. And he came under state investigation for allegedly tampering with voting machines. So how could he lose? Well, you got to get someone even crazier who says, I'll do all of that, plus believe in demonic possession. But some delegates said they grew to doubt DiPerno because unlike Caramo, he conceded his loss in November. Matt ran out on us. He didn't fight for us, said Mark DeYoung, a delegate from Harrison, Michigan, and chairman of the Clare County GOP. Caramo led from the first ballot and increased her lead with every round, but needing three ballots to secure a majority. She won with 58% of the vote to DiPerno's 42%. DiPerno attempted to edge her out by winning support from runners-up. His campaign had prepared flyers announcing the endorsement of J.D. Glasser, or Glazer, I'm not sure which, uh, one S, who received 12% of the vote in the first round. Uh, Glazer said uh, DiPerno secured his support by offering to make him policy director. Between the second and third ballots, DiPerno attempted to make another deal with the third runner-up, veteran GOP consultant Scott Greenlee. That's the one that uh, Greg mentioned. According to people familiar with the exchange, who spoke on condition of anonymity, of course, but Greenlee walked away from the offer and opted not to endorse either finalist. Unlike a recent party, or uh, unlike at recent party elections in Arizona, and for the Republican National Committee, no consensus candidate emerged who could unite the party's fractious coalition. Greenlee came closest as an experienced operative with donor connections and pro-Trump bona fides, stretching back to 2016. And he also secured the endorsement of musician Ted Nugent. And Ryan Kelly, a former gubernatorial candidate who has been charged in connection with the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol. But Caramo, who turned her bid for state chair uh, to her bid for state chair quickly after her November loss, even though she didn't concede it, proved to have the strongest base of support and broadest appeal. Her campaign was vague and varied on specifics 
as uh, for what she do as chair, saying in her speech on Thursday that her first priority would be to, quote, get my hands around the operation. That's not a bad idea. She made faith central to her appeal, but in a weird way, beginning her remarks that night by saying, my number one goal as a Christian is to bring people to Christ and secondarily to save our country. But by the way, I believe in demons. Many delegates interviewed named Karamo's faith as one of their primary attractions to her. Her nomination was seconded by Petoskey attorney Dan Hartman, who said, It's not about election integrity. I want you to understand that I changed my life and decided to serve Christ. Oh, I mean, all right. Several other candidates prominently invoked, invoked Christianity in their campaigns, and you'd think, that that would be the case at the GOP convention. One delegate who took exception was Marla Braun, or Brown, B-R-A-U-N, from Jackson County, who said she was disgusted with wrapping Christianity around Republicanism and abstained rather than vote for either Caramo or DiPerno in the last round. The party has to know that what we put forward here is not acceptable, she said. The first several hours of the convention were taken up by an extended dispute over how the votes would be counted, underscoring the mistrust among many delegates for both the previous party leadership and of election outcomes. How many of us got in this fight because of flash drives and laptops, one delegate said to cheers, arguing against using electronic equipment to record votes at the convention. With hand counts taking sometimes more than an hour for each round of voting, the convention lasted four hours longer than planned, wrapping up just before the venue was due to kick the Republicans out. <laughs> Despite the backing, or his backing, by the biggest name in Republican politics, DiPerno ran a rather sluggish campaign. Sleepy, what's his name, DiPerno? I don't even know, I forget. Sleepy, whatever his name is, DiPerno. So sleepy, I don't even know his name. I see he's so sleepy, he makes me sleepy. Anyway. Uh, despite this, he ran a sluggish campaign and he was often seen wandering the convention hall alone. One delegate waiting to vote criticized him for using his allotted time to present a video endorsement from Trump rather than making his own speech. Yeah, that is pretty lame. DiPerno also had the endorsement of Mike Lindell, the election conspiracy theorist and my pillow CEO. In case you're sleepy, you get a pillow. And Lake. How do you like that? That's a pretty good lineup, and he still lost. DiPerno has touted Lake as a special guest at a pre-election party on Friday at a Lansing bar called the Nut House. <laughs> All right, good choice. But Lake did not appear. <laughs> I'm not going to the Nut House. Forget it. They got to throw a net on me. Anyway, her aides cited a scheduling conflict. She had to go to the cuckoo chamber. I don't know <laughs> where she ended up. But man... All right, DiPerno declined to comment. Several members of Trump's presidential campaign team were present to observe. The campaign did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The state was crucial to Trump's surprise election victory in 2016, but he lost Michigan to Biden in 2020. People love to talk about President Trump in a loss mode, but he's a king. He's our king. Outgoing GOP co-chair Michonne Maddock who was supporting DiPerno, big day for me, Sean, said in an interview, I'm so tired of hearing that our party has moved too far to the right. The problem is we haven't moved far enough. But she didn't, uh, or me, Sean, didn't uh, vote for Caramo, voted for DiPerno. I don't know. Anyway, very weird and confusing, and I hope it remains weird and confusing because it's funny, and when it's confusing, they lose. So good news for normal people in that respect. All right, let's see. Um, speaking of Michigan, we could stay on the topic because despite the fact that we see disorganization in what's supposed to be the organized party political wing of the, uh, Republican party, uh, like the IRA of old, they have their military wing as well, or I guess you could say, and this is, this is a perfectly legitimate thing to say. I, I tell you, know, it's going to shock you at first, right? The comparison of the Republican Party to the IRA probably shocks you as well. But there are a lot of political parties with military wings out there. They're just not operative in the United States. We don't do that, except now, yes, we do. But let's see, IRA, Hezbollah would be uh, similarly situated. I would say um, 
So it's good company. The uh, IRA, Hezbollah, and the Republican Party. Why do I say it? Because here, despite the fact that the Republicans are tearing themselves apart over idiocy and, you know, which lunatic do we back, uh, that bodes well for the paramilitary, the, the, the militant wing, military, mili- uh, uh, military wing of these parties, because, of course, once the doors open to crazy, you might as well add some guns and really go to town. So I have this story uh, shared with me by my brother Mark, who sent this along. Far-right m- Republican groups surge in swing state Michigan. And I guess the... Uh, the electoral wing of the party doesn't satisfy people, and uh, they need to, a demonic possession warrior to head up that wing. Uh, and they're all mad that uh, one of the candidates actually gave a nod to reality. So dissatisfied with that, I guess more and more uh, Michigan Republicans are turning to uh, paramilitary organizations rather than Uh, regular political parties. Here's the story. It comes from Reuters. Nathan Lane, not the famous actor, but the one with with the uh, last name spelled L-A-Y, and he writes this story. Uh, John Smith, if that is his real name, that's John like J-O-N Smith, a local leader in rural Michigan of America First, a far-right Republican faction that denies the results of the 2020 election, wants to shift the entire party to the right, even if it means short-term losses at the ballot box. We need to redefine what it means to be a Republican, he said in an interview, and if that means redefining it as being the losers of campaigns from ever after, uh, I'd be happy with that, but he thinks, of course, good things will come of it. In pursuit of that aim, Smith and other hardliners deployed armed guards to bar moderate delegates from a county meeting last August. That's a little dangerous, don't you think? Threatening to bring criminal trespassing charges against them, according to an email to the moderates seen by Reuters. That's kind of worrisome. A little authoritarian, don't you think? Smith, who is running for party chair in his congressional district, and I don't know, we'll see if we can figure out the outcome of this, um... But, uh, yeah, this, I mean, this is a current article from February 17th. So I guess he would then, therefore, if he were the party chair, be entitled to, uh, I guess, attend the next statewide Republican party, uh, elections. And things go from bad to worse, I guess, given how chaotic the statewide meeting already was, even without, sending party chairs who become party chairs because they send armed guards to block anyone who doesn't support him from showing up at the voting. Uh Uh-huh. It's getting worse and worse. And they, you know, and they think it's getting better. Like we're, we're asserting more control for the real people. Wow. Anyway, uh, so where were we, right? In pursuit of the aim of uh, redefining what it means to be Republican, Smith and other hardliners deployed armed guards. That is kind of scary. Smith, who's running for party chair in his congressional district, also helped persuade state party officials to exclude moderates from his county from a vote on Saturday to choose the leaders who will steer Michigan Republicans into the 2024 election. So I guess that's how you end up with a state convention where the contest is between a Trump endorsed crazy election denier, 2020 election denier, and a non Trump endorsed but even crazier election denier who denies both the 2020 elections and the 2022 elections. One way to do it is you rig who gets to go and vote by telling people that you're going to use armed guards to prevent them from becoming involved in the process unless they're even more uh, radical and uh, insane than your typical run-of-the-mill Republicans. Okay, far-right Republican groups are making inroads across the state, according to Reuters interviews with two dozen party leaders, grassroots members, and political experts sidelining moderate voices, that sidelining with armed guards, I mean, sidelining isn't really the word. Physically threatening and barring the entry of moderate voices. 
risking relationships with major donors and complicating the state party's efforts to rebuild after their worst election results since 1984. America First Republicans now control local party leadership in more than half of Michigan's 83 counties. A senior party official estimated paving the way for an important victory on Saturday when an election denier is expected to be elected state party chair. I mean, that was all they had choices of was election deniers. It was just, did you did you deny all elections or just one of the more recent ones? Critics say the Republican Party's continued lurch to the right after midterm losses of candidates backed by former President Donald Trump could imperil its chances in a state that will likely prove critical to control of the White House and Congress in 2024 with one of Michigan's Senate seats in play. Um, Yes and no. Let me just say that, uh, okay, the critics of the Republican Party's continued lurch to the right will obviously say this, that uh, after losses like that, uh, you could be hurting our chances of winning the state in the next presidential election. And I think what the right wing groups say to them probably in response is what you fail to understand is actually taking over this Republican Party by these far right paramilitary types who actually will use guns and force to win their elections might improve our chances because what we're saying is we intend to do the same to the rest of Michigan voters in 2024. If you're going to go to the polls and vote for a Democrat, our armed thugs will intercept you and prevent you from going. That will increase our chances of winning the election. Well, what? means is it will increase your chances of being able to successfully, quote unquote, successfully steal the election by stealing everybody else's right to vote and threatening them and keeping them away from the polls. That's not actually winning the election. But, uh, you know, in their view, uh, winning the election is, well, we opened up the ballot box and we took out the ballots and we counted them up and whoever has the most in there is the winner. Never mind what it takes to get there or what the the uh, qualifications are that we impose for uh, casting a ballot. And I don't mean here being 18 or registered for X number of months. It means if my armed guards don't like you, you don't qualify. That's the end of it. So, yeah, I imagine they fight about that behind the scenes. I think, you see, you say that our craziness makes us less likely to win an election, but you're thinking of an election where everybody in Michigan gets to cast a vote. I'm thinking of an election where only people who agree with me get to cast a vote. And I'd say we're more likely to win that election. And it's hard to say that they're not. Hmm. Well, the local skirmishes mirror Republican infighting in other swing states and in Congress, where Kevin McCarthy made important concessions to hardline lawmakers to win election as Speaker of the House of Representatives last month. What's going on in Michigan is a microcosm of what's going on in the Republican Party nationally, said Michael Traugott, a professor at the Center for Political Studies at the University of Michigan. The next section is actually, is actually entitled Like a Coup. So, yeah, I mean, it has been a little bit like that. In Smith's Hillsdale County, allegiance to Trump's false claims that the 2020 election were stolen runs deep. Trump won more than 70% of the vote in 2020. In January 2021, local Congressman Tim Wahlberg voted against certifying Joe Biden's victory. Last July, the far-right faction adopted a resolution to protect the party from a hostile takeover of actors with intent to dilute or destroy the values of the party. Voting to expel... 70 moderates. The resolution, which Reuters has seen, claimed the party had been, quote, infiltrated in the 1970s, believe it or not, by members who practice socialism. Oh, so a little bit of a witch hunt here, too. That is pretty interesting all by itself. And uh, golly, that's uh, scary and crazy. And uh, by the way, I noticed along the way as we were reading the, uh, the piece here, this is uh, Joe's, John Smith, who's uh, the one using armed guards to bar people from voting in the county Republican elections, uh, is from Hillsdale County, which I presume is actually the home 
to Hillsdale, Michigan, which is the home to Hillsdale College, which is the weird Christian uh, private college concern operating up there that Ron DeSantis wants to emulate in his takeover of the new college down in Florida. Uh, they keep pointing to wanting to make it the Hillsdale of the South. In case you were wondering exactly what sort of area is it we're dealing with here. But okay, that sounds pretty interesting all by itself, right? So they're making efforts to not only uh, physically bar moderates from these conventions and gatherings, but to purge them wholesale from the party by resolution. I don't know how effective that's going to be, but pretty interesting. So, yeah, uh, to me, this is like a coup of the Republican Party, said Penny Swan, who joined the moderates after seeking, seeing the armed guards at the August meeting. It's like the radical right is trying to take over. You think they're showing up with armed guards at a, in, at a Republican Party convention? And then throwing out the moderates. Uh, it is a little like a coup. I think you're right there, Penny Swan. We'll return with more of this in just a minute. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air. And Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's continue with this Reuters article. Uh, surprising in many ways, uh, or I guess eye opening if you haven't, uh, seen all of this happening in your neck of the woods. But, uh, uh, yeah, a little disturbing to say the least that in Hillsdale County, Michigan, where, uh, Trump, uh, you know, already has, uh, is what, 70% of the vote in 2020, uh, not conservative enough for the local Republicans there. They're showing up armed at local Republican meetings to purge anyone who might have been moderate because, uh, of course, this this is uh, all about infiltration of the party by members who practice socialism from the 1970s. I really don't think their problem stems all the way back to the 70s, but OK. Anyway, uh, right, so uh, Penny Swan, I guess, joined them or was uh, persuaded to join the moderates by the uh, disturbing sight of seeing armed guards at the August meeting. I don't know what happened to her in the end here. For Smith, John Smith, 44, uh, who sells commercial restaurant and industrial equipment online, party leaders should adhere strictly to conservative principles of limited government, low taxes, and expansive gun rights. No surprise. They should shun compromise with Democrats, he said. In 2021, Smith helped charter buses bring Hillsdale residents to Washington to take part in the January 6th protests on the Mall, though he said he did not enter the Capitol. But he was probably lying about that. He said he still questions the integrity of the 2020 election and wants an audit of the state's results. 
While moderate Republicans in Hillsdale share the hardliners' support for low taxes and limited government, and that's the problem, they describe the far-right members as absolutists and accuse them of improperly seizing control. Which I think, if you have armed guards keeping people out or trying to expel them from the party because you don't like them, you are, in fact, improperly seizing control. You can just go ahead and say it. It's not an accusation. It's really true. And uh, anyway, uh, that's interesting. But then again, they probably in the end will say, well, I do support their calls for low taxes and limited government. So what the heck? I've lost, but I'll vote for them in the general election anyway. In October, Hillsdale moderates sued to be recognized as the rightful leaders of the local party. And this month, asked the judge to prevent the far-right faction from sending their slate of delegates to Saturday's convention. Well, that didn't work, I guess. The judge declined to intervene, leaving it up to Michigan Republican Party officials to set the rules on delegate selection. The moderates continue to pursue the case in court. Saturday's meeting is expected to cement Michigan Republicans' shift to the right, and it did. The top two candidates for state party chair have both promoted conspiracy theories in support of Trump's false claims about voter fraud. Nine other candidates who are running, including Scott Greenlee, a political consultant favored by moderates who is seen as having an outside chance. Uh, hmm. Does that not tell me? It says uh, the top two candidates promoted the conspiracy theories, right? Nine other candidates are running. Okay. Um, but I guess it doesn't, the other article said that eventually everybody came around to endorsing Trump's theories about the 2020 election. Anyway, Trump has endorsed Matthew DiPerno, who lost his election for state attorney general in November and is now under investigation for an alleged conspiracy to gain access to voting equipment. According to state authorities, DiPerno, who has denied wrongdoing and called the investigation politically motivated, Declined to be interviewed for this story. His main challenger is Christina Caramo, who lost her election for Secretary of State last November. The selection of an election denier could discourage top donors from supporting the party directly for about 10 minutes, especially if the next chair backs extreme candidates, three major fundraisers said in interviews. If they continue to use that rhetoric to inspire the base rather than focusing on the future, it will make it very difficult to raise funds from major donors said Robert Shostak, founder of the Templar Baker Group consulting firm and a former Republican state party chair. I would just suggest, I'm just going to throw this idea out there for free because I'll be a consultant to the wacko Republicans in Michigan. I would suggest that if you showed up with armed supporters at the houses of major donors, major donors could be made to uh, loosen up their with their checkbooks just a little bit after all and probably contribute to and support your races and uh, um after all, could make themselves feel good about it in the end by saying, well, I do agree with their position on low taxes and limited government. Even where limited government means showing up with armed bandits at my house and appropriating my funds for their collective use, which is a little socialistic now that I think about it. Anyway, moving on. Caramo said some traditional donors only wanted minions and that the party could find new donors among grassroots members and wealthy individuals who had never given before. That's probably a a better and more traditional approach than showing up with the armed folks. But, you know, eventually the temptation will strike them and they won't be able to let go of the idea. Smith, who will attend the state meeting as a delegate, believes such tensions are natural as the party changes direction. By the way, I mean, the rest of the article, uh, this is the same article that outlined what their plans were and the fact that they used armed personnel to get their way and to purge the party at the local level. But from this point forward, it's just sort of kind of assumed like, yeah, it's a normal thing. He's going to attend the statewide convention to elect a new chair because, uh, you know, there was a little questionable how he came to run the Hillsdale uh, area Republican Party. But now what's done is done. And from this point forward, we normalize what he's doing. Even if he stole his seat at the county or the uh, statewide convention by armed force. What are you going to do? Many people say Murdery Trader Green 
won her initial nomination as Republican, uh, the Republican candidate for her congressional district in the same way. And hey, what can be done? You know, we didn't watch very closely. Uh, the Secretary of State of Georgia said that she won, sent a certificate of election, and it is what it is. I guess we're just going to have to live with it from now on. So, Smith, who will attend the state meeting as a delegate, believes such tensions are natural as the party changes direction. Uh, very natural, all at gunpoint. There are some people that are thinking this is the end of the Republican Party, he said. I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And it is, of course, the flash of a muzzle at the end of the tunnel that you're seeing. And uh, what can I tell you? Uh, we're going to, if we, we don't stop normalizing it, I don't know how we're going to deal with it when uh, it finally blows up in our faces. All right, well, that's the end of things for, I think, the Michigan focus for the day. Uh, let's see, a couple of things that we really do have to focus on. Oh, and by the way, how did you enjoy over the weekend finding out more about Congressman Andy Ogles, whose uh, story I brought to your attention thanks to the local reporting on the guy that was shared with us on Friday, or maybe even as early as Thursday. Um, it's always very interesting to me how I see this, the, that dynamic playing out. I get early wind of a interesting story from somebody, read the story, and then everybody uh, in the D.C. area catches on to the story over the weekend, and it kind of blows up, and lots of people who missed the local reporting on it, and I mean, I would have missed the local reporting on it had someone not just simply said, here, look at this local reporting. Uh, it's always interesting to see a national story grow up out of it, and it's fun to see that uh, you know KITM listeners saying, "I know this story already. I've, I've, I feel like I've been tipped off early." We always say it's like getting the newspaper early, although all it is is getting the newspaper. <laughs> it's just making sure that you read some local newspapers when people say to you, "Look at this story from a local newspaper," and you listen to them, and then all of a sudden you look like you're prescient about these things, and it's just. Everybody's going to be interested in this story eventually. Well, it has to start getting publicized somewhere. Uh, so speaking of the, this is a good way to follow up. There's a lot of other directions we could be going and some big stories from over the weekend that we haven't had a chance to discuss, including, um, well, ones from before the weekend. The, I'll just acknowledge the Dominion voting systems lawsuit against Fox News, which has, uh, been able to pry loose some really astonishing text messages among the leadership at Fox News and the top uh, opinion hosts at Fox News, all very candidly explaining that uh, Donald Trump lost the election and he's a total kook saying that he didn't lose the election. But our audience demands that we tell them that story because they've, they're turning off their television sets in droves. We're getting, as uh, Rupert Murdoch notes in his text, we're getting killed, creamed, I think he said, by CNN. CNN, which is covering the actual news of, uh, of Donald Trump losing and Joe Biden being elected, is being watched by millions of people. And we're telling the truth at the moment on our news side that Donald Trump lost and people are turning off their TV sets. So our ratings are plummeting because we're not giving our audience what they want. So wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Let's all go out there and make up a conspiracy theory or perpetuate Donald Trump's conspiracy theory. That's what our people want to hear about, about the election being stolen from Donald Trump, not the reality of him losing the election. So they made that their focus, and uh, they very quickly recovered. Uh, meanwhile, there are texts between uh, the likes of Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, and uh, Sean Hannity saying, "What are we going to? You know, how are we going to handle this? Because this stuff is a false, and b you know, like Sidney Powell, who's perpetuating this, and and Giuliani, and all these people, they don't know what they're talking about. This is not the truth." Uh, Sidney Powell's a nut bar. Everybody knows it. You know, I'm just going to come right out and say it. They're saying to one another. And yet, you know, for the sake of making a couple extra dollars, I suppose they've said, eh, to hell with it. We'll just ignore reality. So that's a problem. And I thought, uh, well, we definitely have to acknowledge it and we'll read through some of the articles about it eventually so we get all the details because it's going to be important to watch how this case develops, the Dominion uh, case against Fox News. But 
for the moment, given what we were talking about going on in Michigan, I want to turn to an alternative model of how you can deal with things like this, uh, perhaps over in, out in Oregon, where uh, the state is weighing the nation's most comprehensive laws to crack down on paramilitary groups. You might think it was uh, not necessary to do just yet. We haven't reached Hezbollah stages yet, except we kind of have because, uh, you know, the extremist weirdos who are driven by their fanatical interpretation of religious scripture for whatever reason are uh, threatening people with guns and taking over an active political party and turning it into a um, Christian nationalist ideological terrorist organization. Uh, and uh, you're going to want to watch out for that. But uh, they're not too early in rising to this challenge in Oregon because they've had problems with these types of groups for a long time in Oregon. HuffPost has this story. It's actually an AP story that they're carrying. Andrew Selsky, the writer behind it, Oregon weighing nation's most comprehensive law to crack down on paramilitary groups. In addition to enacting new criminal penalties, the law under consideration would allow people injured by unauthorized paramilitary activity to sue. I didn't realize that they weren't able to sue up to now. Here's the deal. An armed takeover of a federal wildlife refuge. You know which one we're talking about here. Over a 100 straight days of racial justice protests that turned downtown Portland into a battleground, a violent breach of the state capitol, clashes between gun-toting right-wingers and leftist militants. Well, I think, interesting. Uh, that That's... That's a giveaway right there. I mean, it's an interesting both sides kind of interpretation of what's going on. But just take a look at this for a second. Clashes between gun toting right wingers and leftist militants. Well, if they're militants, then they have to be the equivalent of the gun toting right wingers. But interesting that you would describe the right wingers as gun toting and the leftists as militants, which implies that they're gun toting, I guess, but they weren't. So that's why it doesn't say that they're, you know, gun-toting right-wingers versus leftists or left-wingers or whatever it would be. But uh, that's an interesting setup, don't you think? You know, gun-toting right-wingers and, you know, blah, 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 something, something leftist. Um, well, they're militants and they're equivalent and therefore that's a, that's a neat trick. Anyway, over the past decade, Oregon experienced the sixth highest number of extremist incidents in the nation – despite being 27th in population. According to an Oregon Secretary of State report, now the state legislature is considering a bill that experts say would create the nation's most comprehensive law against paramilitary activity. Long time coming. It would provide citizens and the state attorney general with civil remedies in court if armed members of a private paramilitary group interfere with or intimidate another person who is engaging in an activity that they have a legal right to do, such as voting. Oh, that it would be an interesting and applicable rule and might be helpful in Michigan at some point, now that they have a trifecta. A court could block paramilitary members from pursuing an activity if the state attorney general believed it would be illegal conduct. All 50 states prohibit private paramilitary organizations and or paramilitary activity. Uh, yeah, you would have guessed that they might have. But no other law creates civil remedies, said Mary McCord, an expert on terrorism and domestic extremism who helped craft the bill. The Oregon bill is also unique because it would allow people injured by private unauthorized paramilitary activity to sue, she said. There's a paramilitary bird outside the window screaming its head off. I guess, in protest of this uh, act in Oregon. At any rate, opponents say the law would infringe on rights to freely associate and to bear arms. I'm less concerned about the problem with bearing arms, but eh, yeah, I, I kind of want to understand a little bit more about how this law would actually operate. I'm liking the part about being able to crack down on paramilitary activity. Um, a little suspicious, perhaps, of the part about where, uh, what did it say? The uh, attorney general could block paramilitary members from pursuing an activity. It's a, it's a bit of a prior restraint problem, I guess. But since you know what they're gathering to do, 
Hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's not prior. After all, it's just an, a uh, stepping in to prevent a uh, violation of uh, civil rights that the paramilitaries have declared as their objective for the day. Huh? Anyway, the bill's sponsor, Representative Dacia Graber, a Democrat from suburban Portland, said the proposed reforms would make it harder for private paramilitaries to operate with impunity throughout Oregon, regardless of their ideology. And you don't want armed paramilitaries operating with impunity. That's not a good idea. And yeah, regardless of their ideology, doesn't seem wise. But dozens of conservative Oregonians in written testimony have expressed suspicion that the Democrat-controlled legislature aims to pass a bill restricting the right to assemble and that the legislation would target right-wing armed groups like the Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer, but not black-clad anarchists who have vandalized downtown Portland and battled police. And again, the deft sleight of hand in which they're worrying about the targeting of right-winged armed groups, but not (gasps) black-clad anarchists. Ooh, they're black-clad, as opposed to their black rifles on the other side. The the black clothing is a lot less dangerous. And after all, they've vandalized downtown Portland and battled police, pushing, shoving, probably hitting as well. Who knows? A physical confrontation, no doubt, but not really in the same league as uh, going about armed. It's just not the same thing, despite now twice having tried to make it equivalent. This bill would clearly put restrictions on who could gather in a group and for what reasons they chose to, wrote Matthew Holman, a resident of Coos Bay, a town on Oregon's southwest coast. The pioneering measures raised a measure, just singular, raises a host of issues which lawmakers tried to parse in a House Judiciary Committee hearing last week. If residents are afraid to go to a park with their children while an armed militia group is present, could they later sue the group? What constitutes a paramilitary group? What is defined as being armed? Those are important questions, especially some of these groups show up with... uh, sticks and shields and say, I'm not armed. Armed means guns. And some show up with flags stapled to unnecessarily thick or rigid poles or sometimes scotch taped around baseball bats and say, it's a flagpole. Leave me alone. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think being armed makes a difference and I think, uh, training makes a difference in terms of the paramilitary groups. So one of the characteristics of the, as they say, black clad anarchists who have vandalized downtown Portland is they don't train together as units to inflict the most damage possible in their vandalism. It's individuals who may or may not meet and confer before the beginning of a protest, but it's not like training paramilitary groups, uh, uh, training to inflict the most damage possible with their weaponry. Anyway, uh, Oregon Department of Justice Attorney Carson Whitehead said the proposal proposed law would not sanction a person for openly carrying firearms, which is constitutionally permissible. But if a paramilitary group went to a park knowing their presence would be intimidating, anyone afraid of also going to the park could sue for damages, Whitehead said. Oh, well, that should be interesting. This particular bill is not directed at individuals open carrying. This is directed at armed, coordinated paramilitary activity, added McCord, who is the executive director of Georgetown University Law Center's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. So how do you like that? On the other side of the country in Vermont, a bill making it a crime to operate a paramilitary training camp got final approval from the state Senate on Friday, The measure, which senators earlier approved by a 29 to 1 vote, also allows state prosecutors to seek an injunction to close such a facility. The bill gives the state authority it needs to protect Vermonters from fringe actors looking to create civil disorder, said State Senator Philip Baruth, or Baruth, I'm not certain how he pronounces it, a Democrat and progressive from Burlington, and I probably should know 
I feel like I've run into him before. Baruth uh, introduced the measure in response to a firearms training facility built without permits in the town of Paulet. Neighbors frequently complained about gunfire coming from the Slate Ridge facility, calling it a menace. Barrett's bill now goes to the Vermont House. Under a proposed Oregon law, a paramilitary group, the proposed law, a paramilitary group could range from ones that wear uniforms and insignia, like the three percenters, to a handful of people who act in a coordinated way with a command structure to engage in violence, McCord said. Representative Rick Lewis, a Republican from Silverton, asked pointedly during the committee hearing whether rocks and frozen water bottles, which Portland police said had been thrown at them during demonstrations in 2021, would fall under the proposed law. Uh, I guess they, you, you know, common sense, I guess you would want to uh, have a wide definition of what it means to be going about armed. But of course, you should be 100% certain that those things actually occurred first. And we have a little bit of a history of uh, police claiming to have been targeted with makeshift weaponry before, and it turns out not to be the case. Cement milkshakes, for instance, come to mind. A frozen water bottle and rocks could cause serious injury or death, so they would be considered dangerous weapons under Oregon law, responded Kimberly McCullough, Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum's legislative director. Multnomah County District Attorney Mike Schmidt, whose jurisdiction encompasses Portland, testified in favor of the bill, expressing frustration that police often can't single out violent actors lurking among peaceful protesters. Our current inability to get upstream of this violence before it starts leaves us vulnerable to organized criminal elements who enter into a protest environment with the express intention of escalating the situation into an assault or arson or a riot, Schmidt said. McCord, the terrorism expert, said the measure would mark a milestone in the U.S. where the FBI has warned of a rapidly growing threat of homegrown violent extremism. This bill, as amended, would be the most comprehensive statute to address the unauthorized paramilitary activity that threatens civil rights, she said. The tactic of enabling private residents to file lawsuits against paramilitary groups may be a novel one, but it has been used in other arenas. I'm sure you'll recognize which ones. Environmental groups, uh, and maybe some that you won't recognize. Could be a surprise one here. Environmental groups, for example, can sue businesses accused of violating federal pollution permits. Or perhaps you were thinking of this one. In Texas, a 2021 law authorizes lawsuits against anyone who performs or aids in an abortion. In Missouri, a law allows citizens to sue local law enforcement officers who enforce federal gun laws. But the Oregon bill differs from these laws because only people who are injured by unlawful paramilitary activity could sue, McCord said. The Oregon bill also opens a path for a government enforcement mechanism since it allows the state attorney general to seek a court injunction to prevent a planned paramilitary activity, she said. Whether the bill will pass is unclear. It needs a simple majority in both the House and the Senate to go to Democratic Governor Tina Kotek for her approval or veto. Kotek's spokesperson, spokesperson Elizabeth Shepard, said the governor generally doesn't comment on pending legislation, and I'm sure that that's probably not exactly true true, but uh, looking to keep a low profile on this one for the time being, I can understand that. Anyway, just thought I should bring that to your attention, uh, given what we've read about going on in Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, there's lots more to get to, but lots less time than we want in order to get to it. So let's see, what can we leave you with? Um, I'll throw this out just because I think you're going to need to add this to the to your knowledge base something i saw over the weekend that uh, in addition to banning books and now trying to ban uh ap studies uh in particular the course the african american history course uh under the ap's aegis there's more going on in florida and it's getting crazier every minute florida is considering what they call a classical and christian alternative to the SAT. I guess Ron DeSantis has had it with the college board because they're getting in his way or telling a different narrative about the AP course that he wants to ban. And so maybe he can break their uh, chokehold on higher education gatekeeping 
by banning their SAT as well. Governor DeSantis has talked about finding alternatives to the College Board, which administers the SAT and advanced placement classes. Uh, this in the Tampa Bay Times, Anna Ceballos and uh, Sommer Brugal from the Miami Herald teaming up on this one as Governor Ron DeSantis and Florida Republican leaders explore alternatives to the College Board's AP classes and tests. Top state officials have been meeting with the founder of an education testing company. Supporters say is focused on the, quote, great classical and Christian tradition. They've abandoned the Judeo-Christian stuff, I think, by now. The classic learning test, founded in 2015, so a long, long record of achievement, is used primarily by private schools and homeschooling families and is rooted in the classical education model, which focuses on, quote, the centrality of the Western tradition. The founder of the company, Jeremy Tate, said the test is meant to be an alternative to the college board administered SAT exam, which he says has become, quote, increasingly ideological in part because it has censored the entire Christian Catholic intellectual tradition and that's no they're they're off judeo-christian they're now onto christian catholic catholics have to be appended on to what they believe is christian at this point and other thinkers in the history of western thought and by the way i mean if you're really talking about the history of western thought especially theological western thought it is catholic theological thought for the most part i mean it's not that there's any lack of protestant theological thought but you know for most of history the catholic church was the the, the one and only so anyway i think that's pretty interesting of course they go with the things that the homeschoolers are already using and uh pretty amazing and by the way uh they note uh, at some point during this uh, article that this is the classic learning test or CLT, which is supposedly not supposed to be confused with CRT, which is a bad thing. CLT, which is a good thing among these weirdos. I don't know. And I have often wondered, and I did wonder over the weekend. Sometimes I wonder whether it would be workable to do something as obvious and stupid as trying to pretend that you already have conflated CLT and CRT and go out there and saying, uh, Ron DeSantis is a traitor to the cause. Now he backs CLT in schools. We got to get rid of him. I wonder whether that would ever work. All right. From NetworksRadio.com. Something to think about. You have been listening to Kegro in the morning. But not for very long. David Waldman. Because next, of course, is the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Justice Putnam, and he wants you to think about slightly different things from a slightly different angle, like including, well, let's see, Joe Biden's surprise visit to Ukraine being a very big deal, and the drama of McCarthy's election as Speaker, which may open the House to more C-SPAN cameras. Always interesting.